Hi, my name's Jo Trask. I'm the Health Inequalities Lead at the Cheshire and Merseyside Cancer Alliance. And I'm here to offer you a 10 minute presentation to talk about what health inequality looks like in a cancer pathway. Um, the aim of this is to provide you with an initial platform really to discuss health inequality and how it affects our work, to be aware of resources that are available and the tools that can help you to take action really. So let's dive in. So when we're talking about health inequality, where do we start? You know, there's a little picture of Pingu here to show kind of in cancer, we're really, really aware of health inequality. You know, COVID has shone a spotlight on health inequality for a lot very recently, but us in the world of cancer, it's not new. We've been supporting projects to tackle health inequality for a long time. And most of us, the people, some of the people we work with, we're already trying hard to to reach a lot of people. So we need to acknowledge that that work, that work around reaching people, ensuring everybody participates, is called tackling health inequality. And Ping is there because we, you know, right now with COVID, it feels like everybody's, we must reach people, we must, must acknowledge health inequality. Well, actually in cancer, we've already been doing it for a really long time. But what is health inequality? So health inequality, as a definition, is an unfair and avoidable, that's crucial, it's avoidable difference in the status of people's health. But the term has been commonly used to, um, to look at other differences in the care that people receive. We sometimes call that postcode lottery and the opportunities that, that they have to lead healthy lives, both of which can contribute to their health status. So if we think about health inequality, we think about life expectancy, prevalence of health conditions, um, we think about access to care and how available things are to people, how easy it is for them to get there. And then there's a quality of the experience of that care. So we need to look at patient um, satisfaction. Behavioural risks to health um, and, and personal choice, such as smoking, obesity, and then the much wider determinants of health, so the quality of our housing and our access to green spaces. So when we put all this together, it's, this is a summary. So the conditions in which we born, which we live and which we grow, where we work and how we work and how we age, all these things influence how we think, how we feel, how we choose to act and these all affect our physical and mental health and our well-being. So I'm just going to leave that there a second. We just need to think about some of this is our personal choice and some of this is our situational choice, but these combine together to affect our health. So let's have a think who's affected by health inequality. So differences in health status and the things that determine it can be experienced by people grouped by a range of factors. So socioeconomic factors such as income level or multiple deprivations have a huge impact on our health. This is very well documented. And for example, for us in the cancer pathway, we would see that later presentation of cancer happens in the more deprived your, your personal situation is. But there's other examples, so geography. So if we are working in, an, in a a rural region, for example, I've worked with farmers in my role. A lot of farmers would shockingly say to me, I'd actually rather be able to work and healthy or not here at all, because anything in between is too damaging for the farm and the um, legacy that I want to leave my kids. So lots of farmers won't seek help and also distance and access to services. So we, we sometimes just assume that urban is, is the biggest challenge. Um, and then we have the uh, protected characteristics. So we know that um, people with disabilities, an example would be somebody with um, significant mental health troubles would struggle to get a cancer diagnosis. That might be that they couldn't articulate or they're unable to access services. We know um, more women come forward than men. We know that um, ethnicity can be a real challenge. And then we've got social, socially excluded groups. So people who experience homelessness or um, our traveler communities don't always have access to services. 
So people face barriers we can't see. And I'm going to spend some time on this slide because this is the bit when you're considering a communication skills course. What's stopping people accessing cancer services? So there's some obvious ones on here. So for example, transport. If people need to travel a long way to get to services, then, you know, you think, well, I have a cancer diagnosis. I've got to get there. But what if you actually can't? What if you can't afford the travel? What if there's um, nobody to help you get there? What if you live in a community where there isn't access to those kind of resources? You know, and, and, and next, that kind of rolls into childcare. What if there's nobody to mind your children? Are they OK to come with you? Is there a place for them to, to be looked after? Um, you know, we look at often when we discuss health inequality, we're often looking at um, communities in society that actually have very little resources and can't even rely on each other. They're often they lack of, of support. So people can't just leave uh, the kids with a neighbour and they they don't have a mum to ask. But other barriers are a little bit more complicated. So literacy in the UK, the um, average reading age in the UK is nine. But we know that 20% of people have a reading age of five and below. So that, that's just at the age where you're starting to learn to read. And you put that in context with the amount of information we provide people in the written word. This can have a huge impact on the people we see. So it's just worth bearing that in mind. You don't have to ask. You can just often having it in your head can be really, really powerful. And also, so people feel guilt. Um, an example of this would be in some cultures um, when you receive a cancer diagnosis. It's acceptable for um, the community to turn their back on you. And I'm not talking about, oh, I mean, that happens here in our region, you know, so... Um, you might feel guilt that you're, you're bringing something into your community that um, is going to cause chaos. So you might just choose to, to, to not find out. I also have on here zero hours contracts. So when we're asking people to go for screening or to go to an initial appointment, oh, if you're concerned about that, pop and see your GP. One, it's much harder to see a GP at a convenient time now. And two, um, we might not get paid. And if you don't get paid, some people are living in a, in a way that actually taking two hours off and not getting paid for it is too big an impact on the on the family. So no social support goes back to kind of the childcare, but that can be as much as uh, I always think of saying to somebody, I'm really worried. I've got a lump or I've got a pain and it won't go away. Or I've had a cough. My friends would say to me, are you joking? Get down to the doctor's. Don't be talking to me about it. Go and talk to somebody. If you don't have somebody to verify that worry that helps you move forward, what can you do next with that, really? And then fatalism. So fatalism for me is about um, you live in an area where um, there are high levels of cancer and um, people you know who have cancer tend to die. And so you believe that ca a cancer diagnosis can, can lead to, to death. So you don't seek out help at an early stage or, or join your screening programme. And the opposite can happen in an area where people get diagnosed earlier, have good outcomes. People will seek out that. And again, religious beliefs covers a huge, huge area that we really would need to. Um, there's lots of information on, but we always need to be mindful of what's in people's heads, really. So what resources are available right now? We've designed some handy resources for you um, at Cheshire and Merseyside Cancer Alliance and, and the link will be given. Um, what we have for you, we have this top tips sheet and these are available for, for anybody looking at um, how can I make my service more um, equal? What can I do to improve that, that service? We have a huge range of, of individually produ produced resources on our website. Um, the link is there on the page. Um, I'll ensure that the, the link follows um, stuff around um, religion, um, how to access support. There's a wide range. And finally, there's this change one thing table. So the change one thing table is a really useful way to start the ball rolling. When we think of health inequalities, the wider determinants of health 
it feels so huge that what can we in our service do? So we have this single resource called a change one thing table and it breaks down what one thing would we change? Who do we need on board to do that? What kind of time scale would we give ourselves? And maybe we'd have two sets of time scales. What can we do in three months? What can we do in six months? Who do we need to incorporate? So we have that table available for you on our website to help start to tackle health inequality. So finally, thank you so much for listening. I'm sorry it's a real whirlwind. This is, can be studied as a degree topic, so you can imagine a 10 minute condension is, is a bit of a challenge. And my details are here for you and the link to our um, website with all the resources I've quickly run through for you. I'm always happy to have a chat. So please feel free to know that there is a health inequalities lead in our region ready to support you. Thanks so much for your time.